Hey, good afternoon and welcome to Woodsworth College. We are very pleased that so many of you could join us this afternoon. My name is Carol Chen and I have the privilege of serving as the principal of Woodsworth College. I would like to begin by acknowledging this land upon which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to meet, and to share ideas on this land. I know that many of you in the audience are scattered, you're not in Toronto, so I would invite you to reflect on the traditional land wherever you happen to be. And we have a slide here suggesting a website, nativeland.ca, where you can research the history of the land where you are located. The Morley Gunderson Lecture is jointly sponsored by Woodsworth College, the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources, and the Department of Economics. Woodsworth College has had a long-standing relationship with the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources. In the mid-1970s, Woodsworth established a Certificate in Personnel and Industrial Relations, and in 1986, an undergraduate degree program in Labor Management Relations, later renamed Employment Relations. Throughout this time, a close relationship was established with the center, as many of the courses in both the undergraduate program and the certificate program in human resource management were taught by center faculty. The center also has long-standing ties with economics. From 1991 to 1998, the principal of Woodsworth was Noah Meltz, a former director of the center, but also a professor of labor economics. Given the interconnections between these three units, Woodsworth, the Center and the Department of Economics decided in 2015 to establish an annual lecture on labor economics and industrial relations and human resources. It was named for Professor Morley Gunderson to honor his contributions to Canadian labor economics and industrial relations over the past five decades. There's Morley Gunderson. So I would now like to introduce Professor Dion Poehler, Acting Director of the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources, who will make some announcements and then introduce our speaker, Dion. Thank you, Carol. And good afternoon, everyone, or morning or evening, wherever in the world you are. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first ever virtual presentation of the annual Morley Gunderson Lecture and what is likely to be a record turnout for this event. While we'll all miss seeing each other in person this year, um, the one major advantage of the virtual format is that we're able to include more people than we could normally fit into Kruger Hall and Woodsworth College. Every year at this lecture, um, we uh, present the Morley Gunderson Prize um, that recognizes and honors current students or graduates of the center who combine outstanding professional achievement with significant service to the center. We put out a call for nominations each year, which we receive from alumni, students, staff, and faculty. And I would like to thank Frank Reed and Rafael Gomez for serving with me on the award selection committee this year. There was unanimous support on the committee to award the 2020 Morley Gunderson Prize to Lorraine Sixto. Lorraine graduated from the MIR program in 2004. Since then, she has built a multifaceted HR career in both the private and nonprofit sector. Receiving her MIR degree launched Lorraine on a 10-year career at Kraft Foods and Mondelez International, where she partnered with a variety of functions and operations as both an HR business partner and organizational development leader. Two of her career highlights include providing change management project leadership following the acquisition of Cadbury and earning her green belt and improving the labor relations climate at a manufacturing facility. Following her time at Mondelez International, Lorraine worked at Rogers Communications where she was a senior manager organizational development and provided project leadership for the launch of a new talent management framework and technology. Since 2016, Lorraine has been senior general manager people and organizational development with the YMCA of Greater Toronto where she has had accountability for leadership development, learning programs, employee engagement, and diversity and inclusion. And in addition to her incredible career trajectory since leaving our program, Lorraine has also given back to the CIRHR on many occasions since her graduation by volunteering for our student mentorship program. Morley Gunderson is known for his incredible mentorship of students, and so I am very pleased that the committee chose to honor an alum 
who has also undertaken this important role for our CIRHR master's students. Congratulations, Lorraine. And speaking of generous mentors of students, I also want to take this opportunity to say a few short words about a very important friend of the center, Professor Edward Lazier of Stanford University. Professor Lazier, or Eddie as Morley likes to call him, was the inaugural Morley Gunderson speaker back in 2015. Professor Lazier sadly passed away this year. Rafael Gomez, who will be returning from research leave as director of the CIRHR in July, noted that Eddie was very generous with his time for students and recalls that Professor Lazier held summer workshops free to any student that introduced students to established labor scholars and to the study of personnel economics. I can't even begin to list Professor Lazier's incredible achievements and maybe it just suffices to say that he is widely recognized to be the founder of the field of personnel economics. Professor Lazier was one of those bridge builders in the area of labor economics and industrial relations, as he made economists care about what happens to workers inside of firms, and he gave industrial relations scholars a more rigorous model and approach to thinking about what happens to workers inside of firms. And his insights into peace rate systems came from a deep personal understanding of incentives, as one of his first jobs was apparently picking apricots in California. Morley also told me that Professor Lazier loved mogul skiing, windsurfing, and motorcycle riding. He clearly was the kind of person who operated on and maybe even beyond the production possibility frontier in both his academic and personal life. The quote standing on the shoulders of giants was made to refer to people like Professor Lazier and his influence in, on theory and research, as well as the scholars in both economics and industrial relations will be felt for years to come. Before I turn the podium over to Ettore Damiano, the chair of the economics department to introduce our 2020 Morley Gunderson speaker, I'll just let you know a few logistics. Our Morley Gunderson speaker has a 45 minute presentation after which we'll have some time remaining for you to pose questions that you might have. You can submit your questions to the speaker using the Q&A function at any point during or at the end of the lecture, and I will moderate the Q&A session by posing your questions to the speaker. I promise I will try to get to as many questions as I can. And with that, I will turn it over to Atori to introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, Diane. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Ettore Damiano, and I'm the chair of the Department of Economics. As, um, as Professor Chin and Paul had already indicated, the, uh, the Morley Gunderson, uh, Gunderson Lecture was established to honor uh, Morley's contribution in the field of uh, labor economics and industrial relations. It is also an opportunity to bring together faculty and students at the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the Department of Economics and at uh, Woodsworth uh, College. Uh, these uh, separate units have uh, long been uh, interconnected because uh, an in-depth understanding of uh, labor market demands and understanding of unions and the role in that <clears throat> are, are um, critical to understanding uh, the role of unions in the determination of wage and, uh, and employment. Now, we are uh, virtually together today to celebrate one more time that uh, connection between the three units. And uh, I'm uh, particularly delighted to introduce today, today's speakers for the Marley uh, Gonderson lecture, which is my, my colleague, uh, Michael Baker. Michael is a professor in the Department of Economics and the Canada Research Chair in Economics, Child Development and Public Policy here at the University of Toronto. He's also a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge and a fellow of the Center for the Study of Poverty and Inequality at Stanford University. Uh, Michael is an alum of the University of Toronto, uh, where he received a Bachelor in Commerce degree in 1982, and also an alum of the University of Michigan, uh, where he received a PhD in economics in 1990. Uh, he has been with the Department of Economics since uh, graduated from uh, Michigan, and he's been an excellent and very prolific uh, scholar. 
uh, with uh, over, uh, I counted on the CV, over uh, 50 publications and generating, uh, according to Google Scholar, many thousands of, uh, of citations. And uh, after 30 years at UT, Michael continues to have a very active research program focusing today on how parents' economic decisions affect the developmental uh, trajectories of uh, young children. Uh, Michael is here today to talk to us about uh, universal childcare strategies, and uh, uh, he's a leading scholar in economics literature on, on this topic, having written many papers on uh, childcare programs and uh, children well-being, including a seminar uh, article in the uh, Journal of Political Economy, co-authored with uh, Jonathan Gruber and uh, Kevin Milligan, that uh, has generated over 1,000 citations. Does um, I believe that I speak for uh, everyone when I say that we are uh, most fortunate to have uh, Professor Michael Baker with us today to talk about what we have learned from the perspective of the economic discipline on uh, universal childcare strategies. Uh, please uh, join me uh, virtually in uh, welcoming this year's speaker for the Morley Gunderson lecture in. Uh, Labor Economics and uh, Industrial Relations, uh, Professor Michael Baker. Thank you, Adore. Uh, thank you for those kind words. Um, I'll just find my... There we go. I hope everyone can see it uh, correctly. Anyway, it's a pleasure here to be here today to um, uh, make this presentation uh, and also an honor. Um, I count morally uh, among, um, as a good friend and a good colleague, one of the things I've always liked about Morley or appreciated about him is he doesn't take himself too seriously and he doesn't take his academic reputation necessarily too seriously, which makes him very accessible. People have talked about his mentorship to students. It's also his mentorship to junior faculty. I think that's been um, very admirable in his career and something as um, we grow older, something to emulate. Um, also, before I begin, I, I wanted to thank Jenner Zhu, who helped me uh, immensely preparing this talk. Um, you'll only see a few graphs, but behind that, there are hundreds of graphs which Jenner was producing up to last night. And, and really, uh, I owe her a debt of great gratitude for all the work she did helping me uh, prepare this talk. Okay, so here's the title I wanted to use, um, which uh, was, um, rejected for good reason, because it doesn't really make a good poster, but it does um, describe exactly what I want to do, which is to try to um, explain or uh, tell you about what economic research on certain aspects of a universal child care program can say to current enthusiasm and discussion of a universal child care agenda. But in attempting to answer that question, I think there's a couple of other questions I need to answer first. Um, the first of which is, um, why do we care about the evidence or why do we base policy on evidence? I've taught for about the last decade um, in the School of Public Policy here to our MPP students. And while I did teach them that basing policy on evidence was very important, um, I also realized they knew and I knew that that wasn't always the case. I mean, most obviously advocacy often plays a role and often political calculation plays a role. So while policy may be informed by evidence, it, necess it isn't necessarily designed um, reflecting the lessons of evidence. So why does the evidence matter? Well, uh, we can hope. Um, certainly in a world that's run by me, policy might be run by evidence, but there's also great reasons why the world isn't run by me. Um, but I also think that evidence is useful because even if it's not used in the design of policy, it's, it's important to um, us understanding what the effects of policy are in the evaluative function. The second question this sort of talk raises is why listen to economists? And that might be something that a lot of you ask all the time. Um, the reason I pose that question here is because I want to recognize that economists are not the only people working on this program problem as most of you probably know. In fact, if the, you know, the uh, title of this uh, presentation was The View from Fill in Your Favorite Discipline, 
you would get probably a different presentation, which might come to different conclusions. When I started working in this area, um, one of the things that was often, I was often asked when I met someone from a different discipline was why do economists work on this? Um, well, we work on it because we're interested in human capital and how people form human capital. And we're also interested in the determinants of uh, people's adult outcomes and how they're related to um, childhood experience. Um, so I just, I just wanted to recognize that, or, um, recognize at this point that I am going to be presenting a view from economics, and that's not the only view or the only evidence that you might bring to this policy debate. Why now? Well, it's certainly true that discussion about a national chair, uh, child care agenda, uh, the volume has been turned up in recent months, primarily because of the pandemic. And the pandemic has certainly affected everybody in terms of the labor market. So what I've graphed here is just the employment rates of two groups within the Canadian labor market. These are Canadians aged 25 to 44. And what I've chosen is Canadians in that age group who have a youngest child who's under six years of age. And as you can clearly see, and these are the months leading up to the uh, pandemic, and then the red line is meant to indicate sort of the onset, uh, both these groups suffered a quite severe decline in employment as a result of the first wave of the pandemic, which has subsequently recovered. But I don't actually think that that's necessarily the reason this policy issue has arisen, the fact that employment rates have dropped, because the drops, to tell you the truth, in the employment rates for this group are not that different for the declines in employment rates for other groups within the Canadian population who don't have children. Probably the more interesting question is whether a national universal child care pro program could have buffered the effects of this recession. Because what's true about this, say, 80% of males who remain employed during the first wave, or 65% of females who remain employed during the first wave, is unlike other Canadians, they were at home working with a young child, which um, if you've had a young child, you know would be different from working at home in any other sort of situation. Um, and we really don't have the data to answer that question that I know of. I know there has been some surveys of um, how many childcare facilities have been opened through the pandemic. And the, the data that I've seen does suggest that in Quebec, which does have a universal childcare program, um, Quebec was among the provinces with the most childcare centers open during the first wave of the pandemic. But what's also true is the number of people or a number of children actually in those centers was very low relative to their normal capacity, like other, like the centers that were open in other provinces. And it may be true that even a national child care uh, program isn't really up to, just like public schooling, isn't really up to buffering that sort of effect of a pandemic. We know in our public schools that while they remain open, there are an awful lot of children taking those courses online from at home due to the perceived risks and health risks of the pandemic. Probably the reason the pandemic has sort of fanned discussion about this is that we're having sort of a Churchill moment. Uh, Churchill has said that never waste a good crisis. And um, certainly a lot of public policymakers have been encouraged to think outside the box. And thinking outside the box has led to discussions of how to rethink childcare in Canada, moving to a green economy, all sorts of other things. Well, I have to admit that when I do teach in the MPP program at Tr University of Toronto, and I sort of, I teach first year students microeconomics, and I say to them, you know, you're in a program where there's an awful lot of instructors that are gonna ask you to think about policy ideas and think outside the box, but not here. I want here. I want you to think inside the box. I want you to think inside the box of microeconomics. And so I'm going to follow my own advice and assume that the reason we're talking about childcare so much now is sort of phenomenological. That it's this event that has freed us to think about all sorts of things. But 
the basic reason we might want um, a national child care program existed pre-pandemic. They're sort of the more structural things that are going on. And so a lot of my discussion will focus and my graphs will focus on 2019, for example, a year just before the pandemic struck. Finally, why me? Um, well, if this is a topic that has been of interest to me uh, for quite a while, sort of since I've been researching um, on childcare and maternity leaves and parental leaves and early child development, which really goes back to the early 2000s. 10 years ago, I made an address to the uh, Canadian Economics Association that attempted in a sense to answer the same question. Um, and what I found, which I'll, I'll summarize briefly a little later in the talk, uh, was there wasn't a lot of evidence. That a lot of the evidence in the area in economics was primarily from the US. And in the US, they primarily um, study target interventions because that's the main public policy instrument used down there. And there was a real lack of evidence on what the impacts of a universal child care program were. Um, so it's an ongoing interest to me, and it seems like a good, a good opportunity to update the evidence. Okay, so the way I've structured this talk is I've got a scorecard here in which I've tried to identify what I think are five objectives a universal child care program might have. And you may disagree with these five objectives, or you'd want to um, expand these five objectives, but um, I've only been allocated four hours to speak, right? There's something like that. I'm kidding. Uh, 45 minutes to speak. So these are, I think, will certainly fill the time. And these are the areas that I think econo economists have mostly focused on when trying to uh, research on the, this topic. Now, when I talked 10 years ago, my focus actually, I would have put first uh, this objective of having a positive effect on early child development. And I think at that time that reflected most of the discussion about universal child care policies. There was this focus on child development and the importance of helping children who were developmentally disadvantaged. And the fact that those children were found in families at all sorts of social economic or across the social economic spectrum. However, interestingly, a lot of the discussion about a universal child care program today focuses on female labor supply, that the Canadian economy can't realize its potential when there is a gap essentially in employment between males and females. And so I'm going to um, focus a lot of the talk on that first objective, partly because there's a lot of evidence there to talk about, but partly because that's how the conversation about this public policy uh, proposal, as I perceive it, has shifted um, over the last 10 years. So I'll talk a bit about female labor supply, early child development, family work and life balance, fertility, and finally, whether uh, universal child care programs are an effective instrument to reduce inequality. Okay, so I'll start with mother's labor supply. Anyone who's worked in this area on any of these topics knows that one of the biggest obstacles is there's usually not enough data or any data to actually investigate these topics. But mother's labor supply isn't that, isn't that case. Um, and so I sort of argue this might be the easiest to figure out. Um, we have lots of data that measures labor market outcomes. And so we can take that data to instances, and I'll explain why this is important, where programs are either being introduced or expanded and we can try to figure out what the effect of these programs are on females' decisions to work. And so to provide some context within Canada about why people view universal child care programs as potentially an important way of unlocking the potential of female labor supply, what I've um, got in this table are employment rates. So that's just the proportion of the population that's employed within the age group 25 to 64. And I've chosen that because 25 is sort of after people's investments in university or any post-secondary education have ended. And I've chosen 64 because that's sort of the modal or the target retirement date. Well, 
some people targeted earlier, but it, it's uh, sort of a modal date in the Canadian retirement system. And what I've done is uh, presented here the employment rates stratifying the populations by the age of their youngest child. Okay, so we can see across this entire group, there's approximately an H eight percentage point difference between males and females employment rates. And I think that's what people are talking about, that if we could bring that female employment rate up approaching 80%, we'd have all this additional input into the economy. When we break down that difference across the age of the youngest child, we get the we sort of see the argument of why a universal childcare program might be the answer. The difference in employment rates between males and females is largest right here, right? It's almost 18 percentage points between males who have a youngest child less than six and females who have a youngest child less than six. So as I understand it, this is essentially an argument, if not the argument, of why a universal child care program might serve this purpose of unlocking this female um, labor uh, employment. Okay, so what would an economist predict a universal child care program would do? Well, I'm going to assume that a universal child care program would not just supply child care spaces, but it would do so at a reduced cost. That is, the places would not be supplied at market rates, but rather at a subsidized rate. So what we're really asking is, what does economics predict subsidizing the price of childcare would do? And it sort of depends on how you view childcare, which it uh, in turn depends on how it's offered. Childcare may be offered as a block. That is, if you want childcare, you have to sign on for full days, full weeks, that sort of program. And in that case, we typically view childcare as a fixed cost of work. That if you're going to work, you have to take on this obligation to a child care provider to, for full day, full week um, care. If, on the other hand, we can view child care as being purchased a la carte, let's say, that we could produce it hourly, we could, um, sorry, purchase it hourly, then what we're really talking about is child care costs being like an effective tax on our wage. For each hour of work that we work in the labor market, our wage is lowered by the cost of the childcare we need to purchase during that hour of work. So what happens when we try to subsidize those costs? Well, economists make a distinction between effects on what they call the extensive margin and the intensive margin. But all I mean by that is its effects on labor market participation or the decision to work and its effects on how many hours you work conditional on working. Um, so I can give you the bottom lines on both. The indented uh, points here are just for everybody who has been uh, uh, taken a course that's used one of the seven editions of Morley's textbook on labor economics um, to sort of explain the economics behind it. So what about the extensive margin? Well, if we reduce the fixed costs of work, what that's going to do all else equal is reduce people's reservation wages. Reservation wages are just sort of like the lowest wage that you would accept to start working. And if we lower that reservation wage, we expect people to be more likely to enter the labor market or more likely to enter employment. If instead, if we think of childcare costs as an effective tax on our first hours of work, then again, substitute, subsidizing those costs is like lowering that tax, increasing the returns to entering the labor market. And again, we expect, therefore, uh, to make uh, that that would make entry into the labor market, entry into the employment uh, more attractive. So in either case, we expect that subsidizing childcare costs, well, I say non-negative because it's possible nothing can happen, but perhaps I'll go on a limb here, would have positive effects on participation in employment. When we move to the intensive margin, things aren't quite as certain. It varies a bit on whether we um, view um, childcare costs as a fixed cost or as um, a tax, uh, but uh, sort of the bottom line is it can go either way. Hours can increase or hours you can decrease. 
And so we might say that this is just an imperial question, uh, sorry, an empirical question of what ultimately happens. So anyway, I think the prediction that most economists take to the data when they try to analyze this uh, universal childcare programs is this first one, okay? That we expect to see an increase in participation or employment when they see an introduction of subsidy or perhaps an expansion of subsidized places. So what does the evidence tell us? Well, first, let me say something about how we might go about uh, measuring this. What we really want to do is use variation in childcare subsidies um, that are uncorrelated or unrelated to people's uh, preferences for work or anything else really about them. What economists would say, we'd like the variation to be exogenous. And what that means is we typically don't want to make comparisons across countries necessarily or comparisons within countries over time, sort of relying on that sort of variation in childcare costs that might exist over those dimensions. What we prefer to do is to look at maybe the introduction of a program or perhaps the expansion of the program and use that variation in cost to identify the uh, impact on females labor supply. So that's the sort of study I'm going to focus on in sort of presenting the evidence. And what I can tell you is the evidence from that sort of study is mixed. And so I've, uh, this is a dense slide I realize, but it, luckily the studies sort of congregate into two groups. Um, in the first, there are studies. Now, most of these are from uh, European countries, obviously, but that's where an awful lot of universal child care programs are. Um, in some of these studies, what the authors find when they look at either the expansion of subsidized spaces or the changes in the subsidy rates is there's small to no impact on females labor supply. What they instead find is people substitute out of unsubsidized care into subsidized care. Okay. So what you see is people moving into these newly available subsidized spaces, but there's no corresponding increase in female labor supply. Uh, however, there's another group of studies from different countries and different times, which do find larger effects. These again use the same sort of changes, expansion of subsidized spaces or changes in subsidies, but in these cases, they'll find that the movement into subsidized spaces is accompanied with is accompanied with an increase in labor supply. What about Canada? Well, interestingly, when you read a review of the literature in economics, people always point to Canada as an example of a place where a universal childcare program led to an increase of female labor supply. And of course, I'm talking about the introduction of the universal child care program in Quebec. So for example, some work I did uh, with Kevin Milligan and John Gruber, we found that the introduction of the Quebec uh, child care plan uh, led to an increase in the employment, female employment rate in Quebec of about 14%. Uh, a contemporary study of that by Lefebvre and Merrigan uh, using a different data set also found an increase, this time in labor market participation, of a comparable magnitude. So what are we to take from this? Um, or, what, or what are the patterns there? It's hard to discern, I have to say, but it seems to me that sort of if you read the reviews, what people tend to point out is that uh, the impact on female labor supply tends to be smaller where female labor force participation rates are already higher. And where labor force participation rates are already higher, what we tend to see is a substitution of unsubsidized care into subsidized care, but we don't see the corresponding increase in labor supply. I can also say that sort of surveying those surveys, there also is like, why would that be true? Why does not, why don't the residual non-participants enter the labor market this growing suspicion that has something to do with unobserved preferences, either regarding gender roles, which of course vary by country, and also about who should be caring for children. Now, a recent summary of the research uh, in this area uh, reports that, let's say, a 10% reduction in childcare costs is associated with 
between a quarter of a percentage and 11% increase in maternal labor force participation. That's a huge range. So if I, in making this prediction, I'd rather be predicting interest rates, which I know nothing about, okay? This gives me very little um, basis to be precise, but let me give you some Canadian context that perhaps helps me, helps us think about this problem. So here's another graph. Again, I'm uh, graphing the employment rate of now Canadian females between the ages of 25 and 54, stratified by what the age of their youngest child is. And what we can see is participation, uh, employment rates in Canada are fairly high, okay? For childless females in this category, and for females with children who between the ages of six and 17, uh, the rates are over 80% by 2019. And interestingly, there's no difference, right? There's effectively no difference. The effect of having, or the association of having a youngest child between the age of 16 and 17 um, is nothing compared to having no child at all. The employment rate of, of females with children six years or five years and younger is lower, lower by about 10 percentage points, but probably in the greater scheme of things, it's relatively high compared to some other countries. If we take an internationalist perspective, okay, it also tells us that employment rates of females are relatively high. So what I've graphed here, and this is data from the OECD and from StatsCan, is the different measures of labor supply for females aged 25 to 54. So, sorry. So um, that's, I can't, in this data source sort of identify females with children. So that's why I've chosen that age interval. It seemed the best age interval to sort of capture uh, the females we wanna talk about. So the first uh, set of graphs here are for Canada. And what is graphed here is the employment rate, the proportion of that employment that's part-time and average usual weekly hours. And if you sort of look across countries, okay, you'll see that Canada's employment rate is relatively high. It's comparable to the employment rates in some of the Scandinavian countries that have um, universal childcare programs. It's higher, for example, than some of these countries in which the introduction of universal childcare has had actually large employment effects. So one of the studies that show that universal childcare programs um, have had a large impact on female labor supply is Spain, but you can see that Spain has a much lower, um, or at least a 10 percentage point lower employment rate in Canada. Based on this evidence, you might say, well, I don't know. If it's true that there doesn't tend to be a lot of effect on labor supply, on female's labor supply, if employment rates and participation rates are already high, perhaps the introduction of a universal childcare program won't have the effect that we hope for. Well, let me show you a different graph. So what I'm doing here is graphing again, employment rates. Um, it's again for women aged 25 to 54, but now what I've done is separate the country into two groups. So one, two, set, two of the lines are for Quebec and two of the lines are for what we call the rest of Canada. We do sort of Quebec, rest of Canada analysis. The red lines are for females that have a youngest child who's five years old or younger. And the green lines are for childless uh, females. Let's look at the red lines first. What we can see over the period starting in 2001 and ending in 2019 is initially the employment rates of females in Quebec and the rest of Canada are very similar at around 65 to 67%. But over the period, a huge gap opens up until by the end of the period, they're different by almost 10 percentage points. Perhaps not coincidentally, in 2000, the Quebec childcare program sort of came to fruition. It's in the year 2000 that children starting at birth were eligible for entry into that program. So it would appear to, this graph would appear to suggest that with the sort of fruition of that program, in its development over time, the employment rate of um, women with young children in Quebec 
grew relative to the employment rate of their counterparts in the rest of Canada as a result of that program. But of course, that's the sort of inference that three slides ago I was telling you, you shouldn't do, right? We shouldn't just make these sorts of comparisons across jurisdictions. And one of the reasons we shouldn't do that is because of the we could worry that there was something else going in, on in the Quebec labor market over this period that led employment rates of females to increase. And that's why I've also put in the lines here for childless females. And they do give us some reason for concern. You can see that at the beginning of the period, the, the employment rate of childless females in Quebec was about three percentage points lower than their counterparts in the rest of Canada. But by the end of the period, they were about three percentage points higher. So if we could argue that we could use childless females as sort of a control group, then we might argue that, well, if we introduce a universal childcare program in the rest of Canada, we'd have to attenuate our prediction of what would happen to account for this sort of general increase in the labor or the employment of females in Quebec as represented by these childless females. So I'm not saying that that's the econometrics you want to set up, but it does sort of give you the parameters of the problem in trying to make a prediction of what's gonna happen in the rest of Canada based on what's happened in Quebec. The other thing we have to think about is will the females who aren't currently working in the rest of Canada react to a change in the price of childcare in the same way that females in Quebec did when the universal program was um, um, introduced there. And that's really a question sort of about for the economists out there, what their indifference curves look like. Um, and so that's hard to tell, right? We don't know how many females, it, and there's no data that's necessarily gonna tell us how many females, are just on the margin of entering the labor market and that a subsidy to childcare will bring them in. We can ask them, okay? And that's one of the things you, uh, that's some, an answer you can sort of ask them in data from the general social survey. So the general social survey is a, again, a survey of the Canadian population. Um, and one of the questions periodically that's asked is, if you're not using childcare, um, why aren't you? Okay, and so this is a pie graph that shows you the answers. Uh, in the rest of Canada, four ch uh, mothers with children five years of age or younger, why they aren't using childcare. Now, a certain proportion of them aren't using childcare because they're on maternity leave. And presumably, event when a maternity leave or paternity leave or parental leave ends, they very well could be consumers uh, of childcare. If we look at this other group, however, what we see is the majority of them, okay, either say that they prefer to be at home with their kid or they don't need childcare. Now, what it means when they say they don't need, need childcare, I actually don't know. It may be that they prefer that their child, in response to this question, prefers that their child is with a relative. And I'm too much of an economist to say that um, I believe most people have their price. So if the price of childcare was lowered sufficiently, um, some of these people might change their mind, okay? But the proportion that actually say, I'm not there because the cost of childcare is too high is a relatively small proportion of this group of females we don't see in the labor market. How about the movement out of unsubsidized care into subsidized care? Well, of course, it's going to react to the change in price but the general social survey also tells us about people's preferences for childcare. And what it tells us is that almost three quarters of people report that their childcare is their preferred um, childcare. Only about a quarter say they prefer to have their child in a different type of chair, uh, sorry, a different type of care. And if we look at that group and why they're reporting that, we can see that about half of them report that they're not in the preferred type of care because they're accused, okay, or the cost is too high. So those are certainly people we'd expect that, um, that might move into subsidized care uh, if the provision of, subsidized, uh, provision of care was expanded 
or the, the care was um, uh, subsidized. Okay, so some final considerations. Suppose our only objective for a universal child care program was to expand female labor supply. Another question we'd have to ask is, is this the most effective way to do it? Because there's other ways of encouraging uh, employment and labor supply, for example, things like the earned income tax credit or the Canada workers benefit. Um, again, that's a hard question to answer. Um, but one thing that's useful to think about is what example does Quebec give us? So the Quebec child care program has been in operation for 20 years. And we know that in Quebec, women who have children are between six and 12 percentage points uh, more likely to work than their counterparts in the rest of Canada. What if we were able to um, bring female employment rates in the rest of Canada up to their Quebec values? How much effect would that have on the gender employment gap? Well, the information down here suggests about two percentage points. Okay, if we were to take this sort of accounting exercise as an ac accurate prediction. And the reason that's true is the majority of females, sorry, in this age group don't have kids. Okay, the differences are six to 12 percentage points, but that change is multiplied by a small weight. And so their actual impact on the aggregate gap um, is muted. Uh, by those that, that sort of that loading factor. Okay, so on my scorecard, I'm going, it's going to stick my neck out here, given that I, um, I'm predicting interest rates here, but I would say that's probably true that an extension of universal child care into the rest of Canada would have a positive effect on labor supply. How about child development? Well, why is this important? Um, well, for one reason it might be important is if it, if creating a universal child care pro program didn't have an effect on labor supply, okay, all it did was, was a movement from unsubsidized spaces into subsidized spaces, then why else do it? I mean, one of the, presumably one of the reasons we want a national child care program is because we believe that it can supply superior care. But I also think we should look at this question regardless because children are gonna be primarily affected by universal childcare programs and they don't vote, okay? So it's important for us to be uh, careful custodians of their well-being. So what would we predict? Um, an awful lot of the research um, in this area has uh, been um, influenced by what is called the fetal origins um, hypothesis, which is associated with Barker who wasn't even researching childcare. This is someone who was researching uh, adult uh, diseases. And his discovery was uh, the association between, for example, adult chronic heart disease and uh, diabetes with events in early childhood. In his example, actually nutrition in utero. That hypothesis is really reoriented an awful lot of social science research on child uh, development and adult outcomes. An awful lot of research in social science is now focused on the early childhood period and attempts to connect things that happen in the childhood period to things that we see in adulthood. So we have this sort of reorientation, if you will, of all this research. And we also have, uh, coming from the US, the results of a number of RCTs, randomized control trials, um, probably the best known is this Perry Preschool study, would have which have looked at the impact of high quality early childhood education interventions on the lives of disadvantaged children. And the message from those studies is that those sorts of interventions can have long lasting, dramatic and positive effects on the lives of disadvantaged children children. So the question really posed for universal programs is does the Barker evidence and the Perry Preschool evidence add together to support a universal childcare uh, strategy? 
Well, a number of considerations that we might think about in trying to make that extension. Uh, one is external validity. Um, an awful lot of those RCTs are focused on very disadvantaged children and involve very high quality childcare. So it's a matter of some concern if we're attempting to extrapolate that to the sort of broader population that might be served in a universal childcare program that might not be of similar quality. Underlying that extrapolation are questions like whether advantaged or disadvantaged children respond to a given stimulus in the same way, okay? And that's something that we're gaining knowledge about with time, but also whether disadvantage means the same thing for more or less economically advantaged children. So this is something that I took up in my previous talk on this area. And one of the things I found was if we look at disadvantaged, developmentally disadvantaged children at about the age of two in Canada, and we stratify them by the wealth of their family, by their social economic status, and then we look at them 14 years later, perhaps unsurprisingly to you, disadvantaged children from affluent families have a much higher probability of not being disadvantaged when they're older than disadvantaged children from um, economically disadvantaged families. So that suggests that there are different trajectories of these sorts of children, depending on the economic background of their um, families. Finally, there's a the issue of scale, okay? Can we scale up these RCTs to um, the size um, required by a universal childcare program? So what is the evidence in this area? Well, it's fairly uncontroversial to state that programs targeted at disadvantaged children have positive developmental effects. It's also pretty uncontroversial to state that universal programs deliver benefits to disadvantaged children However, I haven't seen a lot of research on whether this is the effective way of doing it. That is, would it be more effective to deliver that sort of care and early education in a targeted fashion, or is there some additional advantage from placing it within a universal childcare program? However, whether universal programs deliver benefits to more advantaged children is an open question. And we also might want to um, ask the question of whether we actually want them to deliver benefits to more advantaged children, but I'll leave that for a couple of slides. So when I surveyed the literature 10 years ago, um, we really didn't know a lot. I surveyed uh, studies from Canada, Denmark, and Norway, and my conclusion was that in these programs, there was either no effect or negative effects on children's development at the mean, but some positive effects for low-income children. I'm fortunate for this talk that David Blau, who is a longtime contributor to research on childcare and um, early child development and economics, has recently completed an update of my study, surveying the evidence that has come out in this, you know, the interval of 10 years. And his conclusion, based on surveying that additional evidence, which is primarily from Europe, um, I'll just pick it up here is that the case for public investment in high quality universal preschool programs for the purpose of improving child outcomes is not very compelling on either social efficiency grounds or equity grounds. The problem being that these programs do deliver advantages or benefits to disadvantaged children, but the impacts on children from more advantaged backgrounds are usually smaller and in some cases non-existent or harmful. So since I've written one of these papers, I'd be uh, neglect if I didn't try to answer this question. Negative effects, why is that? So as you see, there are now a number of studies that have found this outcome, mostly for Canada, but also studies from Norway and for Italy. What are the possible explanations of universal childcare having a negative effect on children from more affluent families? Well, what people are currently focusing on is the alternative care they might otherwise um, experience. And that if we um, develop universal programs to improve the environments of children from economically disadvantaged families, they may not represent an effective gain for children for more, from more economically advantaged children. 
I'm sorry, from more economically advantaged families that should read. So this most recent study from Italy uh, focuses in particularly on one-on-one -on -one adult child interactions, which they argue are important for development and that one-on-one -on -one adult child interactions actually might be lower for children from more uh, affluent families when they move into public childcare. So on our scorecard under early child development, I would score to, um, a positive effect on early child development. Yes, for disadvantaged children, no for advantaged children. How about family work-life balance? Well, there's a mechanical effect here that literally if a child is in care, of course, there are gonna be fewer hours that the mother or both parents are gonna spend uh, caring for the child um, because the child, get, the caregiver is supplying that care. But I think the more interesting question in this, um, um, uh, for this objective is whether childcare programs change the focus of parents' decisions, and in particular, the decisions uh, mothers make about employment and about their careers. So let me explain that. Uh, so one of the most interesting areas of research in uh, this topic in economics currently um, is on the effects of having a first birth on female socioeconomic trajectories. So there's now a number of studies, primarily from Scandinavian countries, where the data exists to do this, that have identified what happens after a first birth in the labor market as being pivotal to a female's subsequent earnings and progression in their career. And this happens as a result of, in part, of firm transitions that are made after the first birth. Um, females transition to other firms, which tend to be lower paying and offer more attenuated career trajectories. Now, why do they do that? Well, the speculation is that these transitions are in response for needed employment flexibility, that they're moving to firms that are in a sense more family friendly, but at a trade-off of paying lower wages and offering sort of more compressed career trajectories. But that hypothesis is yet to be um, 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 tested, I think, explicitly in the literature. So it's an open question whether family policies can reorient these decisions and lead females um, to make career decisions and work decisions, which are in a sense untied from this pivotal moment of first birth. There has one been one attempt to do this, a very ambitious paper just recently out uh, by Clevin and co-authors that looked at a series of policies in Austra Austria um, but they found no evidence that either a series of uh, the policies in Austria covered 40 years, including both parental leave and public child care, they had little effect on females' decisions over this sort of pivotal moment of the first birth. So I would basically say the evidence there is unknown. How about fertility? Um, well, what do we expect? A subsidized child care program, I mean, economists think of this probably not like anyone else. We think about the cost of having kids and we think about the quality of children, which I'm not gonna pretend everybody thinks about it that way. But we can think of a subsidized childcare program as lowering the opportunity costs of having a child and therefore we might, it might promote fertility. But it all, the program may also enhance females' career trajectories. And in that case, we might expect it to increase the opportunity costs of having further children. It turns out this is an area in which there's very little evidence. I was surprised when I actually went to find the evidence that there is little, very little evidence, at least in the economics literature. Um, there is a study from Germany uh, that looked at some expansions of public childhood there that uh, found that the programs had a positive impact of fertility, but perhaps surprisingly it was on the intensive margin. It was having more kids rather than the decision to have any kids. And then this study by Clevin also um, found that there was no effects of the programs in Austria. I realize I'm testing your patience. I'm up to 45 minutes. So let me conclude my final point and then my conclusions. The final thing that we might care about is whether these programs have an impact on inequality. And enthusiasm for universal child care is always sort of tempered or dampened by the fear of the so-called Matthew effect. Um, so these programs appear to benefit disadvantaged children. 
But however, if they also benefit advantaged children and higher SES households either disproportionately take advantage of the program, um, there's a potential that child, universal child care can become an agent for inequality. That is actually promote inequality within society rather than diminish it. So when we think about this problem, on one hand, there is evidence that higher SES households disproportionately take advantage of universal programs. There's evidence from Canada that that's true, and there's evidence from Germany that that's true. There's also evidence from Norway that higher SES households capture higher quality centers within these systems. Now that partly is generated by um, stratification in residence by SES, but it's also um, um, sort of fanned by the actions of um, parents. So on one hand, we might expect those sort of factors to increase inequality or to promote this Matthew effect. But on the other hand, as I've already said, there's no clear evidence that universal child care programs make advantaged children better off. So that dampens sort of the Matthew effect. The one program that I, I mean, the one study I've seen that's a, tried to explicitly address this pro problem in economics using really great data from Norway. So being able to track people right into their adult earnings found that the program in Norway did tend to level the playing field by having positive effects on the, uh, for children, on, sorry, positive earning effects for children from low income families and negative earning effects for children from higher income families. So for a reduction in inequality, I'll say maybe. So let me conclude. So how I'm gonna conclude is I'm gonna say, well, what if economists run the world? Now I know for you, for some of you out there, that's your idea of a special place in hell and for others out there, it might be a special place in heaven. But if you tried to inform this agenda strictly based on these objectives and the evidence on economics, from economics, what might you do? Well, I think in terms of labor supply, we can still expect a positive effect on labor supply, but I put an asterisk there because we don't really know that this is the most effective way of increasing female labor supply. And if this were our only objective, we'd have to think about that given the billions of dollars of public funds involved in the universal childcare program. Certainly if our sole objective was to have a positive effect on early child development, we would target. A positive effect on work-life work balance, really unknown at this point, and I would think in 10 years, given how active the research is in that area at the moment, that someone doing the same talk in 10 years would have more to say about that. A positive effect on infertility, we still don't know. And in terms of inequality, I think again, the, um, the, the, the advice would be to target. I mean, if we knew why universal programs sometimes had negative effects on children, more affluent children, and we knew how to offset effect, okay, then we could argue that universal programs um, could be an agent for reducing inequality because they would benefit children from lower uh, income households and have no effect on children from higher income families. But it's sort of a hard sell as an inequality project to say that you're actually going to put in a program that you're going to decrease inequality by hurting some children. That, that would seem to be a hard argument to make. So the safer uh, sort of bet in this case is to target. Okay, well, I thank you for your time. You've been more than patient. I've gone over and I apologize for that. Thank you, Michael. Um, maybe you can uh, uh, stop sharing your slides and then I think um, we can uh, turn to the Q&A now. Um, and the, as the questions start to um, roll in, I just wanted to say that I absolutely, I was so excited about you doing this uh, talk because it is so timely and I think it's, it's a really sort of heavily debated uh, issue right now. Um, and just uh, some, since there's not a lot of evidence on the fertility question with N of one, I can say that universal childcare will have absolutely zero impact on my fertility. Um, so just, just as an N of one. Um, so let's go to the questions as they come in. Um, Thank you for this interesting presentation. Do you think the conversation moved to discussing mother's labor force participation rather than child development because of your research showing poor outcomes for children in Quebec? 
Um, no, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't presume that would be true. Um, no, I mean, it is, I, I, am, I do find that interesting that that occurred. Um, certainly the original focus, as I understood it, the original focus on early child development was heavily influenced by some research by Doug Wilms based on the NLSCY. And that was research that showed for Canada that developmental disadvantage uh, was not restricted to low-income families. He, he presented this evidence that um, you were not as likely to find developmentally disadvantaged children in affluent families, but you could find them, that it was a non-trivial proportion there. And that certainly was the, one of the bases for people calling for a uni universal approach to this, that if we didn't have a universal approach, we leave those disadvantaged children in more affluent families behind. But on the other hand, we have come some way, certainly um, when I, that study came out that I wrote, um, there wasn't an awful lot of other studies showing that um, you, you know, programs could have negative effects. There's now a lot more studies. So um, I, if that was the reason, I would say it's probably those lot more studies rather than uh, the study I wrote. Okay, next question is, does higher employment of mothers when they have young children lead to higher employment of these women when they age? Yeah, well, I mean, we, um, so there is a paper like by Lefebvre and um, Merrigan um, and another co-author whose name escaped me at the moment that tried to look at the longer run impacts of the uh, Quebec program. And they argue that it does, right? They argue um, that the, the initial effects on female labor supply have persisted. And certainly if we look at, at a point in time, like in 2019, if we look at the employment rates of females in Quebec with children between the, in, in their teenage years, they're higher than their counterparts in the rest of Canada. And we might argue, well, those are mothers who had their kids in the Quebec childcare program at a younger age, were able to enter the labor force and those effects have persisted. So there is some evidence out there that yes, there is some persistence. Okay. When we talk about disadvantaged children, how is that defined? if not economically, or is it defined? Is that how it's defined? So I did um, use it in two different ways in the talk. Um, a lot of the time I was talking about economically disadvantaged children. So that would be uh, family stratified either by family income or, or some other measure of socioeconomic status. But in other times I did talk about developmentally um, disadvantaged children. And there, what we would be using is some measure of child development, like um, a Peabody vocabulary test or a motor social development score, some sort of test um, that are given to children. And then we'd be identifying children, perhaps uh, one standard deviation from below the mean, or maybe in the bottom 10 percentiles, or maybe the bottom 25 percentiles, something like that. Okay. Do you think your arguments about negative effects on child development apply to kindergarten as well as child care? And if not, why not? Do I think they do? It would be speculation. I don't, I haven't studied that. So I, I, I would be speculating. Uh, I'd be thinking outside the box. I'm not gonna think outside the box. Um, so no, I, I don't have direct evidence that they would. We've, you know, it's interesting. Um, there have been a number of studies in the US have, that have looked at the expansion of kindergarten and its effects on mother's labor supply. I can't off the top of my head tell you whether they've also looked at the impact of those expansions on um, child development, but that would seem to be a promising way of perhaps doing that. Okay. Great and fascinating presentation, Dr. Baker, given your past work analyzing the Quebec Universal Child Care Program. What do you think of the federal government's recent announcement that they plan to base a national universal child care program on the Quebec design in the next budget? And if you aren't a huge fan of that design, do you have preferences for a targeted design or simply improve subsidization of current child care spots for lower income households? 
Um, well, you know, I'm I'm not an advocate, and so saying I'm a fan or a not fan, I know may all sorts of. As I tried to indicate at the beginning of the talk, policy gets made um, for all sorts of reasons. Policy may be informed by evidence, but it, being informed of something doesn't necessarily mean that it, that something directs what you do. Um, I would say that um, the majority of evidence in economics would counsel targeting, especially if funds are scarce. Um, that you know the most bang for the buck would be accomplished by targeting. Uh, but the government may have different objectives or other objectives um, in proposing a universal childcare program. And I can't really speak to those. Okay. Um, what assumptions, oh, I think I just lost that question. Um, what assumptions are made in estimates that universal child care programs pay for themselves, be it in Quebec or the rest of Canada? Well, they're made, um, so I know the person I think most prominently associated with this argument in Canada is Pierre Fortin, who's done a, a number of calculations looking at the um, um, <clears throat> Quebec situation. I mean, those, those prime, what my understanding is most primarily driving uh, those estimates are the big labor supply effects. Um, which actually exists for the Quebec program, right? I did, I did note that the Quebec program appears to have had big labor supply um, effects and bringing, those pe bringing people into the labor market generates tax revenue. Um, and so, which can in turn, um, you know, be applied against the monetary costs of the program. And I haven't reviewed in detail uh, Professor Fortin's calculation, but my speculation is that's, you know, one of the major contributors is that the program needs to have this big labor supply. Okay, actually, and just uh, I'm my own question to follow up on that. Um, you know, why is there such a focus on female labor supply? Um, you know, wh what is what is the what is the rationale that you think is behind that? Well, I mean, as I understand it, I mean, is that we have a, a, a significant, you know, half the population whose employment rate is significantly below the other half of the population. Uh, people don't work for a variety of reasons, obviously. And so uh, expecting that 100% of people would work within the working ages uh, um, interval is probably unrealistic. Uh, but to the extent that we can enable people to work as much as they want um, is you know, sort of a good thing as, as a review. And um, male employment rates, as you saw, uh, when they have a child at home who's uh, five or under, is in excess of 90%. And so the actual question I think that, that people want to answer is, well, why isn't that also the same for females? Why is it as low as 72%? OK. Um, does the result of Quebec's general child care on female labor supply imply the impact of some child-related benefits sponsored by corporations on employees' labor supply? Okay, um, so is the question whether a, a private firm's um, program to, would that, does it, oh, is there external validity? Yes. I see. And also, I think I also think the other part, maybe, maybe if I'm reading the question correctly, I also think it's, you know, it does, is there an impact of the fact that there are some child related benefits sponsored by corporations in Quebec impacting? Oh, I see. I see. That's really hard to answer, right? Because we don't really have good data on private. It's sort of like trying to uh, uh, research pensions. Um, we don't really know um, a lot. We don't have a lot of data on those sorts of, um, of benefits, in a sense, that people receive through their employers. And be, partly because the, the firm data is sort of confidential and private, and it turns out most employees, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone else, are not very accurate in reporting the benefits they receive through work. Um, so I actually don't know. I know there's a very recent paper uh, out in the US uh, sort of surveying the provision of, in the US context of parental leave and trade leave to employers. But I don't know of a lot of studies that that have been able to take advantage of that aspect of the problem, knowing 
of having data on uh, firm level sort of benefits. Okay, and we have just a, a comment instead of a question um, that we have to look at the quality or style of childcare offered in a universal childcare system to ascertain whether children in different socioeconomic groups would have been disadvantaged or advantaged or not. Investment in early childhood education is key. Do you have a response to that yeah, comment? I mean, that's, that's something I, I didn't mention in the talk when I said, when I was talking about negative effects, when our original study came out and some of the subsequent studies came out, uh, part of the reaction within the academic community um, was, well, that's, well, it wasn't very good childcare. But that the fundamental problem was, was quality. Um, and there were some studies in Quebec um, that did criticize the quality within the Quebec program and, and suggestions to improve, uh, for improvement. So there was this narrative that you, you found negative effects uh, because the childcare quality wasn't very high. Now, in the subsequent study that I did with um, John Gruber and Kevin Milligan, uh, we were asked by, by the referees more explicitly look at that issue. We attempted to do so uh, by looking, trying to compare the quality in Quebec um, to the quality in other countries using some common scale. So some of the studies in um, um, Quebec had used this rating system that also had been used uh, to, to evaluate some childcare programs in, in, in Europe. And surprisingly, what we found is that the childcare in Quebec was of comparable quality to the childcare in Europe, right? It wasn't this, this explanation that Quebec childcare just was not very good childcare didn't seem to stand up using that metric. Now, I'm not saying that that what the metric, and it just, I'm sorry, the acronym, nor what the acronym is, doesn't come to my mind immediately. Uh, you may have criticisms of that as a measure of childcare quality, but nevertheless, um, that argument didn't seem to stand up. Now, I, you know, I'm not, obviously the quality of childcare is important. Um, and that, that's exactly, I think, why what people are sort of focusing in now to try to understand that negative effect is, uh, the child quality of child care is important, but it's also important relative to the chair, the care the child would receive if they were not in the program, because it's the difference between those two cares that's going to sort of determine so the developmental consequence of being in the program for the child. Okay, I'm going to group these next two questions together because um, you may not know the answer to them, but maybe maybe you do. Um, do you know what the net fiscal costs are of introducing a Quebec style national child care program? And I think related um, when the advocates say that there will be a massive benefit over costs like $2 to $17 for, for two dollars for every $17 spent. Are they accurate? Um, is, is that or is this just a, a justification, a political justification? I mean, I, I mean, I think as I said with the, the, the estimates of made effect, those are built up from assumptions about how the program is going to affect labor supply, et cetera, et cetera. So those estimates are only as good as the assumptions they've made along the way. I haven't personally reviewed any of the uh, uh, evidence that has been brought to bear recently uh, for the uh, a universal child care initiative. Uh, at the national level. So I, I can't really comment on the accuracy of those forecasts. Okay. A recent paper by Clevin examining the EITC in the US shows that the participation rates of single women with and without children have converged around the year 2000. Why do you think we've not seen a similar convergence in Canada given similar policies around childcare? So that's the, sorry, could you roll uh, back? Yeah, a recent paper by Clevin yeah, but, yeah. examining the earned income tax credit in the United States yeah. shows that participation rates of single women with and without children have converged around the year 2000. Why do you think we have not seen a similar convergence in Canada given similar policies around child care? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I, my quick answer is I don't know the answer. Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, the structure of supports for um, at least low-income single mothers are different in the two countries. Uh, welfare reform in the 90s in the US introduced things like term limits um, 
and other um, instruments that we don't necessarily see analogs um, in Canada. But I'm, I'm really just suggesting possible explanations. I, I think that's an interesting question, but I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, now we're getting into some of the interesting, uh, contra more controversial elephants in the room kinds of questions. Oh, good. Um, my, I think my internet's going. Yeah, <laughs> mine too. <laughs> mine too. Um, so, in a, do you think in a in a in our society that government should should create policies aimed at changing how women spend their time? Next. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. An economist would approach this as, you know, people make should make their own decisions based on the constraints. Now, obviously, governments change constraints, um, and they tend to modify behavior by changing those constraints. And people will change their behavior if you change their constraints. I, I get that. So you're really asking me, uh, do governments have the fear to change constraints in this way? Um, and that is an area in which I, I have to claim absolutely no expertise. Um, and so, I mean, I can't, I can't see, as I said, policy is made for a, a variety of reasons, right? And evidence is just one of them. I tend to try to focus and emphasize the evidence, but I think now we're moving into uh, the other influences uh, that might motivate the policy uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so I think I might just end with um, one final question. Since you started at the beginning by saying, um, you know, if that if economists ran the world, or you know, if you were if you were in charge of everything, so I'm going to actually ask you if you were in charge of everything, is this a policy universal childcare? Is it a policy that you would introduce, um, given what you know of the evidence right now? I think, given the resources are scarce that there isn't unlimited amounts of money to spend on this. Given the evidence that I know, um, I, my, my, my intuition would be the target. I mean, as an appeal to authority, I appeal to uh, Jim Heckman, right? Uh, who advocates tirelessly for targeted, high quality interventions into the, uh, um, for disadvantaged children. I mean, I think that is where the balance of evidence lies in economics. And so that would be personally what I, I um, that, that, that would be if I ran the world, what, what I would uh, first um, pursue. Well, so I would vote for you, Michael. So if oh. you ever decide to decide <laughs> You sold me. So I think we'll end there. Um, this was uh, just such a great talk. It was, I, I love um, I love the rigor that you put into this in terms of reviewing all of the evidence and thinking about all the sides and thinking actually about it from a theoretical perspective to begin with. Um, so thank you for taking the time, Michael. Um, I also just wanna take a minute to thank um, Stephanie Woodside, uh, Kate McLeod, Barbara Track and Tria, I actually don't know Tria's last name, um, work study student at Woodsworth uh, College who have been in the background making sure that this ran smoothly. Um, the rest of us, I think would have been a lot more stressed without all of them. So thank you very much um, to all of you uh, who helped put this together. Um, and, and again, thank you to Ettore and Carol for the uh, great partnership between economics Woodsworth College and the center. Um, it's really valuable. We're like a, a big extended family um, and I really enjoy this, this lecture. I don't know if either of you want to say anything um, before we shut down. I just want to add my thanks to Michael and, and we always, you know, this fascinating, I'm not an economist, so I'm always fascinated by this, um, this type of, as you say, vigorous argument. Um, and I also, you know, Woodsworth always values the relationship with, with the center and with economics once a year. Um, I might also add, normally at this time in the event, we would now be inviting everyone to stay for the reception, which sadly we cannot do, but the thought is there. Just one more final thanks to everybody, to Michael for this uh, wonderful speech and for uh, you guys for organizing this. I always enjoy this, uh, this lecture every year. Well, thank you everybody. And um, hopefully we will get to see you all in person um, at some point very soon in the after times. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.